Welcome to Lake Toxway United Methodist Church and this service of worship. It is good to be together in worship this morning. Um, are you hearing me through this? Okay, good. I worry about that because I can sometimes hear myself, sometimes I can't. Um, I want to make several announcements. The first announcement is to ask that you would give attention to the sign-up sheets in the, North, uh, in the fellowship hall during coffee hour. The second announcement is to remind you that we will have our Christmas Eve service at 7.30 on Christmas Eve. And um, please listen to this, and I hope you'll understand. Christmas Day falls on Sunday this year. And Ruth and I have talked and made an executive decision. We will not have a worship service that morning uh, because of the number of us who have celebrations so I'm encouraging you come for Christmas Eve at 7 30 and that will be our weekly does it say seven but I think we did 7 30 and I've got it set if it says seven we'll do seven um, it says 7 30 on the bulletin the sign outside let's do 7 30 just because I think that gives some of you a little you Last year we went to 7.30, I know, because some of you asked for that because you have a meal and it's harder to get your meals done and get ready, so we'll do 7.30. Sorry about that, Ruth. Um, so we'll plan on 7.30, um, and I know we did it last year because it made, I remember being not so rushed to get from First Methodist from a service that Kim does at First Methodist and get up here. So we'll plan 7.30 if you'll spread that word. That would be helpful. The worst thing that could happen is people come at 7 and they sit and prayerfully consider and contemplate God's incarnation into the world. Um, pardon me? They get a seat. That's correct, Paula. Uh, also, Betsy, do you want to say anything about the collection? It's, it's quite full back there, by the way. And Betsy, I'm going to add to that. I, you know, I get the privilege of being in multiple places in the community. And this week I was somewhere, and somebody I didn't know said, you're the pastor at Lake Toxley Methodist Church. And I said, yes, among many roles. And the individual said to me, thank you. And I said, okay. And she said, I'm a member at North Toxway Baptist Church. And your church supports our food pantry. So I just want you to know you support multiple food pantries in this community to assist people, and, and it is appreciated and recognized. So thank you. The thank you really belongs to you, not to me. Thank you. Also, I have an announcement to make. John Shoemaker, uh, as one of our lay leaders, plans to start a men's Bible study in January. And he plans to meet twice a month. And so the January dates are the 14th and the 28th, and in February the 11th and the 25th, and then in March the 11th. But primarily, if you are a man and you are interested in attending a Bible study, he plans to do it on, that's a sat, those are Saturdays at 9.30. Please see John Shoemaker and talk to him if you're interested, because uh, it's still open to some slight adjustment if uh, you're interested in attending. 
Are there any other announcements I need to make? Then let us uh, stand, which is the reason we have gathered. We've gathered to worship Jesus the Christ. In the midst of the barren land, in the midst of the dry desert, in the midst of sorrow and sighing, And we shall see the glory of God. Our hymn of praise is hymn number 203. MJ and Rick Dobbins come to light the Advent candles on the Advent wreath this morning. Yes. 
see the lights. Let their brightness fill you. Come, feel the warmth of the lights. Let them give you comfort. Come, draw near to the lights, for God breaking through you. Come, rejoice in the lights. God is with us. And let us continue as together we pray the opening prayer. God of glory, we rejoice in the good news of your promises. Come into our parched world and shower us with your gushing, abundant water of life. Enter into our brokenness and renew us with the strength of your love. Be born anew in our hearts and in our world. Come, Jesus, come. We are ready. Amen. You have the appointed scripture passages in the bulletin in front of you. I invite you to follow along uh, as you desire, whether you want to read as I read, or perhaps you prefer to listen to the word. The Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, verses 1 uh, through 10. Uh, it follows an oracle about the destruction of the nations, and then the prophet Isaiah promises the restoration of the promised land and the joyful return of the exiles in Babylon back to their home in Jerusalem. And some of this you have heard already because the liturgy that we've used today in our greeting um, and in the prayer, some of it's really repeating, um, but it doesn't uh, hurt us to hear a second time some of these words. The desert and the dry land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. They will burst into bloom and rejoice with joy and singing. They will receive the glory of Lebanon, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. And they will see the Lord's glory, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and support the unsteady knees. Say to those who are panicking, be strong, don't fear. Here's your God coming with vengeance, with divine retribution. God will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be cleared. Then the lame will leap like the deer, and the tongue of the speechless will sing. Waters will spring up in the desert, and streams in the wilderness. The burning sand will become a pool, and the thirsty ground fountains of water. The jackal's habitat a pasture. Grass will become reeds and rushes. A highway will be there. It will be called the holy way. The unclean won't travel on it, but it will be for those walking on that way. Even fools won't get lost on it. No lion will be there, and no predator will go up on it. None of these will be there. Only the redeemed will walk on it. The Lord's ransomed ones will return and enter Zion with singing, with everlasting joy upon their heads. Happiness and joy will overwhelm them. Grief and groaning will flee away. Here it ends the reading of the Old Testament lesson. The Psalter lesson we read comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 47 through 55. It is a scripture passage that it comes, we think, it really is kind of a prayer that we've seen repeated in the Old Testament, and now this is just a portion here that we have um, that uh, Mary sings after um, the announcement that she will uh, give birth to Jesus, the Savior of the world. So it's a song or prayer that she knew and she sang after that announcement. So let us read it responsively. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God my Savior. He has looked with favor on the low status of the servant. Look, from now on all the Holy 
He showed mercy to everyone from one generation to the next who honors him as God. He has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy. And the epistle lesson comes from the book of James, chapter 5, verses 7 and 10. Uh, James is writing to a group of uh, listeners who are experiencing persecution. They are discouraged, and he's saying to them, wait patiently. The Lord will come. And they're anxious for the restoration of the kingdom. They're anxious about their personal situation. And again, James is saying, wait patiently. Therefore, brothers and sisters, you must be patient as you wait for the coming of the Lord. Consider the farmer who waits patiently for the coming of rain in the fall and spring, looking forward to the precious fruit of the earth. You also must wait patiently, strengthening your resolve because the coming of the Lord is near. Don't complain about each other, brothers and sisters, so that you won't be judged. Look, the judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of patient resolve and steadfastness. Here and ends the reading of the epistle lesson. Will you please stand for the reading of the gospel? The gospel lesson is from the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. And in this passage of scripture, um, you know, John the Baptist shows up a lot in Advent. Last week we read about John the Baptist. You remember the story and how he said um, when Jesus came to that one was coming that he wasn't worthy to tie the um, thongs of his sandals. Well, today's gospel lesson John is in prison, and Jesus uh, is teaching and working with his disciples. Followers have gone to him, and John in prison is doubting, um, is wondering, is this really the Messiah? So we'll read the story of John sending his disciples to ask Jesus this question. Now, when John heard in prison about the things that the Christ was doing, he sent word by his disciples to Jesus asking, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Jesus responded, Go report to John what you hear and see. Those who were blind are able to see. Those who were crippled are walking People with skin diseases are cleansed. Those who were deaf now hear. Those who are dead are raised up. And the poor have good news proclaimed to them. Happy are those who don't stumble and fall because of me. When John's disciples had gone, Jesus spoke to the crowds about John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A stalk blowing in the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in refined clothes? Look, those who wear refined clothes are in royal palaces. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. He is the one of whom it is written, Look, I'm sending my messenger before you who will prepare your way before you. I assure you that no one who has ever been born 
is greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is the word of God for the people of Christ. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Uh, Excuse me. Please stay standing. Um, I'm getting old. And let us sing our hymn of preparation, hymn number 250. Please be seated. Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, we are joyful to be in this place of worship. And to know the assurance of the love of God that sustains us, that is present with us in all situations of life. In this holy season, but also a season of busyness, anxiety, we ask that you would again turn our thoughts clearly to you and the reason we gather and the reason for this holy season, your advent in Jesus the Christ into the world. And let us be reminded of that reason in such a way that we will be unapologetic 
in proclaiming you as Lord. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Oh, we're well into the season of Advent, the third week. I can hardly believe that. And by the way, that means you only have two weeks left till Christmas Day. Yes, some of us still have greeting cards to write. Some of us still have baking to complete. Packages to wrap and mail. And some of us still have shopping to do. Oh, come on, men. You have not bought your gifts yet. I know. We are notorious of waiting till the last minute. I decided this week for my children, I'm just going to give cash. That's what they want anyway. And I can wrap it up in a box and they'll be delighted, much more delighted than the gifts they get from their mother. (laughs) Because you know it's about a competition to be the favorite parent, right? (laughs) At least in my household it is. My two older children get home on Wednesday, and I'm so excited I can hardly wait. It is a season of waiting, of expectation, and preparation, but not for families to gather, not for packages to be open, but for the coming of the Messiah. And if we're honest, perhaps just like John the Baptist in the gospel lesson this morning, we have some preconceived ideas about who the Messiah is, what the Messiah should be like. John in the gospel, and remember John the Baptist, now, you know, if I need to remind you of the story, so I'm going to, because... I think you're mostly biblically literate, but in case you're not, I'll remind you the story. Remember, John comes from a long line of priests. John the Baptist is the son of a priest, and his mother Elizabeth is a relative of Mary, the mother of Jesus. You remember that? And... First, Zechariah, that's the father of John, is told that he's going to have a child and that he's got not going to name the child in the family tradition of naming children after a father. He's going to give this child the name John, which, you know, is bad enough that he's not going to get his family name. And Zechariah doesn't believe it, so if you don't remember the story, do you remember what happens to Zechariah during that season? He cannot speak. He's struck dumb. Isn't that interesting? Struck dumb means you can't say anything. Boy, I wished I was struck dumb sometimes. (laughs) And then when Mary receives the announcement that she is invited by God. Many people don't read the story that way, but if you read the last line of the angel's annunciation to Mary that God wants her to be the mother of God, in the literal Greek, Mary consents and says, do unto me as you have said. So Mary could have said no. She consents. So when Mary consents, And one of the things the angel has told her, Mary asked questions about how is this, can this happen? I've not been with a man. And then, you know, that's strange enough. And then Mary is told, by the way, your cousin Elizabeth, the one that's really old and beyond childbearing age, she's already conceived and is going to have a child who's going to be the forerunner to your child, the Savior of the world, the Messiah. And so Mary Mary gets up and runs to be with her cousin. And lo and behold, that baby, who is John in Elizabeth's womb, is the sixth month, leaps for joy when Mary gets to the door of the house. And 
It's an exciting thing. And John the Baptist has been busy throughout his ministry proclaiming Jesus as the promised Messiah. And he follows in the line. He's the last prophet, the line that began way back in the Old Testament. He's the last prophet leading up to the promised Messiah. And yet today... In Matthew's Gospel, John is imprisoned. And by the way, most of us know the outcome of John's life is not going to be very pleasant. You know that? Yeah, it's really, it's grueling. Um, I'll wait and share those details with you when the, we get to that point. But it's not a very pleasant sight. And so John in prison... is wondering. He knows his fate. His days are numbered. And he is wondering that all I proclaim was all that I did. Is this really the Messiah? Is Jesus really who Jesus is supposed to be? And who can fault John? He's in prison, not really because he has done anything wrong, but simply because he's caught up in this battle between Roman authorities and Jewish authorities, and they don't like the trouble he's causing. And a paranoid king doesn't want to deal with the trouble that his own people, yes, Herod was the troubled king, he doesn't want to deal with the trouble his own people are causing. So he thinks putting him in prison is a good place. So no wonder John the Baptist is filled with doubt. Wouldn't you be filled with doubt? Oh, come on, be for real. And so he sends his disciples who obviously have the opportunity to visit him in prison. So there's some benevolent, benevolent mm -hmm, whatever that word is, ben benevolence on the part of Herod to let the disciples of John the Baptist go see him. And John the Baptist says to them, please go to Jesus and ask him some questions. If he is the Messiah, the promised one. And so the disciples go and Jesus tells them. And much of it you noticed in the reading was in italics because it was a direct quote from, you noticed that italics part? Well, that meant it was a direct quote that Jesus was saying. And in Matthew's gospel, that's important. Because Matthew wants to be clear that Jesus is the promised Messiah. So Jesus quotes and says, Tell John the Baptist all these things that I am doing, their fulfillment of Scripture. The deaf can hear, the lame are walking, the dead are raised to life, and the poor have good news brought to them. In some ways, the doubt of John the Baptist is getting John's disciples, Jesus' disciples, the crowds, pointing them all to pay attention to who Jesus is and to listen to his message. Some of us may be going through some scary, uncertain, even helpless times. But whether or not we are, we can be assured that all of us are going to go through those times. An uncertain, helpless, scary times have a way of shaking us up, don't they? Oh, really? They don't shake you up? Well, I'm going to come be with you the next time something happens in your life. 
Because I think they do. And the gospel lesson in John, of John being in prison is a reflection of all of our spiritual journeys. We can be like John the Baptist. When we are moved by the Holy Spirit, we vow to follow God, and it's very clear we are true and our intentions are right. When we receive blessings, we are sure Jesus is our Lord and Savior. But most of us, when we face adversity, disaster, we question if Jesus really is the Savior. We question when bad things happen. Where is God? Why is God not here? And we even sometimes, if we're honest, doubt if God really exists. There's a tendency to know for certain that God exists when we're in the good times. But we move to doubt in the times when life becomes uncertain, complicated, frightening. But you know what I have learned? Being in doubt can move us closer to God. I want to say that again. Being in doubt can move us closer to God. John the Baptist may be in doubt, but his questioning points not only himself, but all the people to see Jesus and who he is, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. People pay attention. And they hear and they see and they find God's grace. And it brings good news back to John the Baptist who is doubting and it brings good news to the world. Doubting is a necessary part of all of our spiritual journeys. Sometimes in that period of doubting, it feels like the process is unbearable. Have you ever been in a place like that where you feel like it's, you know that you're God's child redeemed by the blood of Jesus, yet you feel like you're in the desert all alone much like John the Baptist must have felt in prison. And thus, John the Baptist needed confirmation. He needed a word from Jesus to assure him that Jesus was the Messiah. He needed encouragement in an uncertain and anxious moment. Advent is the season of waiting, expectation, and preparation for the coming of the Messiah. And we are blessed to know with certainty of the birth of Jesus. Yet we are still waiting for the second advent of Christ into the world. And we live in a world that is full of anxiety and fear, chaos, disappointment, anger, enough so that people question the presence of God. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but I get so distracted by my own self-centeredness and my own anxiety, my own preconception about what God looks like or what God should do, that I forget 
that my life is to be about proclaiming the birth, the death, the resurrection, and the salvation of Jesus the Christ. And actually, during this season of Advent, we're to slow down. Do I need to say that again? Ah, I think I do. During this season of Advent, we are to slow down, reflect, pray. While, yes, we know that Christ has come into the world in the first Advent, we are still to reflect on that and reflect also and pray and wait for the coming of our Lord again. We need to reflect on what it means to be a follower of Jesus, of seeing and hearing our Lord. Because in a very real sense, all of us have experienced what Jesus said, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf here, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them. After all, weren't we once crooked? I love the imagery of Advent season. After all, weren't we once crooked, but now we all stand straight. Now, maybe our physical bodies don't allow us to stand straight. I know I've just now tried to put my posture back to be straight. But it's a spiritual crookedness moving to a spiritual straightness. Weren't we once unclean, but now cleansed by the Holy Spirit? Didn't we die to our previous life and we are alive in Christ? Didn't we once poor in spirit receive good news? And truly if we keep our eyes and our ears open, we, he we see and hear plenty, plenty stories plentiful stories of God's actions in the world. And it's time to share those actions, those words with those who are in doubt. In one of my meditations this week, I read these words. All of that stuff that isn't right yet in us and in those whom we love will be satisfied and healed. But most likely, it won't all happen in this lifetime. It's not the end of the quote, but I'm going to stop there and tell you. When I first read these words, I thought, I'm ready to stop right there. <laughs> but it goes on. And in the meantime, comma, sometimes a very mean time, comma, we continue to come back to Jesus to be reminded of his real presence with us and his provision to meet our immediate and ongoing needs. End of quote. Yes, we may be waiting in uncertainty, but we are waiting in hope because of Emmanuel, God's presence with us. Over the last several weeks, we have consistently read from the prophet Isaiah, who is bringing the good news of Emmanuel to us. And today, Isaiah said, They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. 
strengthen the weak hands, and I'm reading from a different translation we read, but make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong and do not fear. For the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads and they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Yes, the Lord shall return. This year, because I wanted to change things up, because sometimes in repeating the old familiar things, we kind of don't pay attention. In lighting the Advent candles, uh, for years we've used the theme of joy, hope, peace. Some of you remember that. And the third Sunday, the pink candle represents the candle of joy. But you've noticed in the reading of the lighting of the Advent. Yet some of you noticed it's different this year. Well, that was by intention so that we had some different ideas. But I have to tell you, this week I have missed that theme of joy and it really is what should... It, it is the theme this week. Because when we see and hear God's presence, Emmanuel, in good times and in bad times. And we know that God is coming again in Christ. Isn't that joyful news? Then let us be a people of joy. Whether we face trying times or whether we're living in good times. And for most of us, it's both at the same time. But let us live joyfully because yes, we will see the glory of our Lord. Amen and amen. We continue together in worship and I invite you to take your hymnals and as you take your hymnals, you will turn in the back to page number 881 as we share in this historic confession of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. Will you stand and affirm what we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Please be seated, and we come to that time where we offer our prayers, believing God hears and God responds. Of course, we continue as uh, we have been praying now for some time for Connie Costigan, for uh, John and Sue Thomas. Mary Ann, you're here, so, but we'll keep you on our prayer list in spite of that. Um, you received, or many of us did receive, an email last night from uh, Don and well, from Carol Guffey. Uh, you've seen him present with us in worship. You know they plan to be back with us. Um, it threw up my heart to read that he's driving to the store. And by the way, from their house, I know where it is to where the store is. 
that tells me lots, even though I read that Carol is saying be careful. But that's encouraging. Um, I also add to our prayer concern someone that I don't really know, but uh, she is a mother. With, she's a single mother with a nine-year-old child. Uh, she's a dear friend of someone who is a dear friend to me. She uh, is dealing with stage four cancer. It's breast cancer. They will not do surgery unless she has response to the chemotherapy because the cancer has spread to her liver and to her bones. So um, things are not good there. And her name is Shelby, and I would ask that you would hold her in your prayers. We also read this week Kitty's uh, email and note that the friend that she had asked us to be praying for, the young father, um, has gone and joined the church triumphant and pray for his family. Um, are there other concerns? I know that many uh, among us have lost loved ones, and we certainly know that this time of year is a time that they are um, in our memories and we find ourselves in sadness, so we pray for them. Are there others you would have us pray for? Yes. And remind me of his first name, Jai. Thank you, Bobby. Are there other prayer concerns you would share? A lot of people are traveling uh, this season, and I think we just need to keep all in our prayers uh, for safe travels. I don't know about you, but you know, when I took Jeremy back a few weeks ago to Atlanta to go back to school, both on the way down and on the way back, I was acutely aware of just numerous accidents because our roads get clogged during holidays. So I think Fred's point is wise, not to mention people even who are flying and traveling by other means, other concerns. Yes, Rick? The people of Aleppo. Um, the people of Aleppo and so many places in the Middle East. Um, Yes, Lisa. There is praise. Thanks be to God for rain. I never thought I would say praise God for rain because I don't know, but some of you like me struggle with those cloudy days, right? Okay, don't tell me I'm the only one. <laughs> yes, you do. You're just embarrassed to admit it because we went for so long without rain that nobody wants to admit that we struggle. But I am so thankful for the rain that we have received and for being back into what is a normal, regular pattern for the place where we live. And I remind myself how much I enjoy seeing those beautiful rhododendron and evergreens out there, how dependent they are uh, on ha living in a climate like this. So we are thankful for rain that has come. Yes. Prayers for all those on the coast of North Carolina, South Carolina, and even down into Georgia. Yes, Marianne. You know that my daughter and her husband are missionaries, and they've gotten their visa, and they're leaving Christmas night to be in London for four years. So Beth and Franklin serve as missionaries really to the um, Muslim world, but... Um, they will be based, as Marianne said, out of London. So we pray for them. And Marianne can't say it without being emotional. Many of us have other needs that we may not share but are important as well um, for parents, for children. So uh, unless someone else needs to state a name, I invite us to go. As always, the altar is open as we prepare to pray. <laughs> Still and know that I am God. Be 
still and know that I am God. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord that healeth thee. O Lord, when we read passages during Advent season, passages like we read from Isaiah, where there shall be water on parched land. At least I understand that metaphor, that image better this year. After having lived through the drought and the anxieties and worries of fires all around us in western North Carolina. But I also understand how rain like we received which is slow and steady how it nourishes and is soaked in the dry and parched ground and even though it's winter resurrection fern on trees sprouts alive and moss turns green and I am reminded how the breaking in of your son Jesus brings alive those of us who are spiritually in a time of struggle, a time of warfare. Oh God, we have shared numerous requests by name, by place, by situation. And we trust, O oh God, that you hear our prayers and that you respond. We pray as well that you would hear our unspoken request. O oh God, we ask that you would lift up our prayers to you and that you would open our ears and our eyes to see and to hear your response. We pray it in the name of the one who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we continue in worship as our ushers come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Generous God, you have given us all that we have and all that we are. We thank you for the opportunity to respond to your love and generosity by sharing our gifts with others. Our hearts sing with joy as we work with you to bring true peace to our world. As we prepare for the coming of your Son, May our lives proclaim your good news for all throughout the earth. Amen. And our closing hymn is hymn number 230. this place with joy, whether we are living with uncertainty or whether we live with great certainty. As I said, most of us live with both at the same time. But we go out in joy. We know that Jesus the Christ has come among us, one of us, to redeem us, and we proclaim with joy his salvation 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.